So it's a pleasure to have you here in uh, Zubud. Uh, I hope I pronounced his name uh, correctly. I just call him Ian. Uh, Ian uh, did his uh, PhD in uh, pharmacology department in UCL uh, with Trevor Smith. Right? And, uh, and then he moved to uh, the lab of Martin Hoyser when I was a postdoc there as well. Uh, he worked on the cerebellum. Uh, on the uh, granular cells, and um, we actually collaborated on one of the projects, which was a lot of fun. And now, and then he left to Edinburgh University, where he established his own lab, I think five years ago, or something like that. So he's actually working both on the cerebellum and on the uh, motor cortex and the relation between them. And he's going to tell us uh, mostly about motor cortex today. So, yeah. Well, thanks, Vicky. Can everyone see you in the back? Um, yeah, well, thanks for the invite to come out and speak about some of the work that we've been doing and uh, for yesterday's cycle tour um, of Jerusalem, which was uh, superb, considering it's what, 25 degrees here and back home it's about minus 5 degrees. <laughs> Any chance to get outside in the warmth is really not that good. So, today I'm just going to talk about sort of uh, one of the projects that we're running in the lab, which I started uh, when I moved up to Edinburgh from uh, Mike Moses' lab, where when I was in Mike Coyser's lab, we were sort of developing um, ways to record from single cells using patch clamp electrophysiology in awake behaving animals. And then I sort of, uh, folks in general, were interested in motor movement, moved across the motor cortex to really try to, to look at what kind of activity we're seeing um, in uh, pyramidal neurons or, or excitatory neurons in, in primary motor cortex. So what I'm going to talk about today is um, some of the results that we've been uh, recording or finding where we're looking at um, behavioral state and its effect on both the, the sort of input sensitivity and the firing rates of different uh, pyramidal neurons. And what I mean by behavioral state, I'll say up front, is just to be, uh, to be open is the fact that it's the, the difference between relative inactivity um, uh, versus uh, motion. I'll show you what kind of motion we actually mean. It's not a learned task, so this is not for reward. And we purposely did that to really just have a look at when the animal is engaged in spontaneous voluntary uh, motion, in this case it's, it's locomotion or, or grooming, and what kind of activity we actually see in motor cortex, to then develop that further to see what differences in comparison there is um, between the type of activity you see in motor cortex when it's actually engaged in a, a specific learned motor task and it's going to receive reward for executing that task. So in general, going back a number of years when I've been uh, interested in, in the cerebellum and understanding sort of the, the control of motor movement. Um, so the lab is generally geared towards trying to understand how we initiate and control complex motor movements. And obviously this is important in terms of uh, as humans or as animals we are navigating trying our 3D environment, we're interacting with our 3D environment, especially for, let's say, um, animals and ourselves who have to be able to navigate, to be able to find food, to be able to exist, and ultimately uh, to be able to find a partner, to be able to procreate. So almost everything that we do in life ultimately um, results in the execution of, of a motor movement or a, a, a complex system of motor movements. Um, and to a certain extent, I agree with sort of with Daniel Walport, if you've, if you've watched his TED lecture, or uh, if you haven't seen it, I urge you to go and watch his TED lecture online. It's really, it's a fantastic talk. But he, he classifies himself as a, a, a movement chauvinist, but basically he states is that the only reason that we actually have a brain is to be able to produce adaptable and complex motor movements. Um, and the, you, I mean, you're watching the TED lecture, but the, the, the example he gives uh, is the sea squirt, which is just a little uh, animal that sits on the bottom of the, uh, the ocean, and it sort of navigates around the bottom of the ocean, and then once it finds a, a, a sort of a current where there's a lot of, or a high density of, uh, of food, then it positions itself there and then it just digests its brain. So that's his reason for saying that actually the only reason that we have a brain in any, any shape or form is to produce those movements to allow us to, uh, to exist. So what is left? The nervous system uh, after it digests the brain? It's basically just an eating machine. Yeah, but uh, spine or what? Uh, oh, in terms of the sea squirt, no, I don't think it's even that complex. It just basically processes food. It's sitting there and it's catching little bits of plankton, whatever, takes it in, digests it, and exists. How many nerves? <laughs> oh, I'm, I'm, I'm not a sea squirt person. I'm working on that. I have absolutely no idea. You guys go to. Uh, 
So that's what we're interested in general, more as a movement, more as a command. So as I said, some of the, the people in the lab, sort of half the lab is working on um, sensory motor processing in the cerebellum. I'm not going to talk about any of, of that work today, but we're much more interested um, in trying to decipher what sort of um, spike patterns are, are generated during the initiation and the, uh, the execution and maintenance of motor movement. Um, so looking at primary motor cortex, which obviously initiates the, the motor command, which descends down into the spinal cord, activates motor neurons, and then can actually generate contraction of the, the, the muscles. So this is, and ultimately what we're trying to do is I'm going to try over the next four or five years to try and piece these two together to really understand why the cerebellum is actually feeding in to the control of uh, motor movement. But I show this video in general just to say why the sort of importance in terms of humans Understanding how we initiate and control complex movement I think is important because I, mean, I think this video um, sort of illustrates the fact as humans and I guess as animals the level of complexity and coordinated activity of our, our muscles that we can achieve is, is pretty phenomenal, pretty outstanding. So that's our basic aim is really trying to get at uh, to a certain extent the understanding of how the system is set up and operates. So all the work I'm going to talk about, or the model of choice that we use in the lab, is the is the mouse. And so we're going to talk about the, the mouse primary motor cortex. Obviously, to a certain extent in this talk, I'm going to completely disregard the decades worth of phenomenal work that's been done in the primate, and just focus down on, on the mouse as a model that we can use to sort of um, perturb uh, and at least be able to use new techniques to be able to go and have a look at how motor command generation might actually occur and what it means for the for the behavior of the animal. So just to give a bit, a bit of background on forelimb motor cortex in the, in the mouse, so it's, it's a little bit unlike the rest of the cortex in the fact that it's classed as the agranular cortex because it doesn't actually uh, have what we class as the normal uh, layer four. Um, here's a, an image we took from a, a thigh one GFP mouse which uh, selectively expresses uh, YFP it is in layer five neurons and you can see in S1 you've got a sort of tight band of, of layer 5 here and then in forelimb motor cortex which is here there's a sort of expansion of layer 5 um, and a large uh, increase in the number of cells that are, 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 are present in layer 5. And some beautiful work done by Gordon Shepherd where what he was doing was injecting uh, into either the brainstem or into the spinal cord and using retrograde tracing to come back to identify corticospinal neurons and that's what's shown here, where those uh, cells are containing um, beads. Um, these are red beads, but you can see in sort of layer 5B, which contains all the corticospinal projecting neurons. And pretty much um, all the data I'm going to show, well, at least half of the data I'm going to show today is from layer 5B. And we're targeting um, that region to at least be able to sample from the region which will contain uh, neurons which are projecting directly down the spinal cord and can directly influence uh, motor movement. Also show some data from the superficial layers from layer 2, 3 as well. So that's the agranular cortex um, or uh, motor cortex in mouse. Um, and in terms, there's not a huge amount of work being done in mouse in terms of mapping where the inputs come into uh, motor cortex. But Gordon Shepard again um, has done quite a bit of work on, on using um, optogenetic techniques to map the flow or at least the connectivity um, present within, within M1, but he's doing this in an in vitro slice preparation. And to cut a long story short from a few publications that have now came out, what the belief from the in vitro work is that information from cortical and subcortical areas comes in predominantly to, to layer 2, 3, processed in layer 2, 3, then descends down to layer 5, layer 5B, and then descends out from cortex to uh, subcortical and spinal cord uh, areas. Um, I'll go on to show you from some of the data that we're getting from layer 2, 3 in, in particular um, behavioral uh, instances that we don't necessarily think that this is. So this would be a sort of feed forward flow of information. We don't believe that layer 2, 3 is necessarily really providing the drive to layer 5B. We've got a sort of belief and we're working on now that there's actually similar to semantic sensory cortex, which Randy Bruno's seen, that actually thalamic input can potentially drive layer 5B directly. Actually, if I correctly, you told that layer 2 projects to layer 5A, 
sort of a uh, not to layer 5 here. So there's a bit of both, yeah. There's a, there is quite a strong projection to, to layer 5 here, which is going to come <coughs> back into the stride. Um, there was projections to layer 5b as well. I mean, what I would recall from this model is that the layer 2 3 and layer 5a are sort of interconnected, and layer 5b is more disassociated between them and receives more uh, input from the outside, not inside the yeah, he was talking about yeah connectivity coming through as well um, in terms of from other some other sensor, but he, he wasn't necessarily clear because he also showed the loops coming back in again and um, going from layer five A back up to layer two three. But it was a, I mean, what their idea was that it was a general laminar flow coming through more the cortex. But from these areas and actually identifying exactly how strong and whether these inputs have been activated, we can show connectivity. Yes, in terms of functional connectivity, I don't think it was entirely clear. But he's definitely, he's definitely suggesting now as well, and speaking to him recently, that the LANIC input, similar to what Randy Bruno is showing in uh, somatic sensory cortex, could, in actual fact, provide almost two, two cortical processing units where you can have input coming into layer 2, 3 and being processed to layer 5 and then going back into the motor system uh, to the striatal and then back in again. And also the potential that you're getting cortical input to layer 5b that can go directly out so it can sort of bypass each other to a certain extent. But it's, it's definitely not clear. So there's been a lot of in, uh, in vitro work done, and in terms of some of uh, uh, the in vivo work that's being, we're starting to get an idea. This was work done by Daniel Dombeck in David Tank's lab, where he's doing population imaging uh, in layer 2 3 using uh, bulk loading of, of calcium uh, dyes. Um, and they're in a weak behaving mice that are on the, the David Tank air suspended ball. Um, and then if I show you here when we actually start it under quiet wakefulness, uh, hopefully you can see there's just one or two spots of activation, but when the animal starts to begin to move and use the ball in a, a sort of meaningful way, and even uh, during uh, grooming phases, you start to see a sort of explosion of activity within layer two, three, or at least uh, a high degree of activity that they are starting to try and piece together the correlations in terms of what this means in terms of motor movement. So we're starting to get some information in the superficial layers using uh, two photon imaging. And then also work done by uh, in Prukai's lab in Izamura, where they were using rats which were trained to do a lever push-pull sequence. So they'd push the lever in the forward direction, hold for one second, and then pull it back to reference. And when they held it for one second, they'd be given a, a sugar water reward. And um, what they found by just sampling sort of semi-randomly across all different layers across the, uh, the forelimb motor cortex <coughs> is that you could get cells that were uh, ramping up their activity before the actual lever moved, during the lever being held in one position, and then also um, during the sort of return of the lever back. So what they were kind of saying was that there's a, there's a, um, a different populations of neurons are encoding different features of the the movement. So we're getting some information at the, the level of two photon um, imaging uh, of clusters of neurons, and then there's been a lot of work done on sort of single unit activity. But what we were really trying to get at, and some of the techniques that we're <coughs> developing for the, the cerebellar recording, is being able to transfer those techniques into the motor cortex to really try and understand our behavioral state or this transition from inactivity to movement, what effect this has on uh, sort of sub-threshold activity and the potentially network rhythms, um, and whether during this engagement in voluntary spontaneous locomotion, whether it changed the input structure um, to excitatory neurons in motor cortex, and then ultimately if there is a change in input structure, how does this actually uh, affect the input-output transformation of these um, individual neurons? So that was the motivation for the project, and as I say, we've sort of developed techniques similar to what um, uh, Mickey's using here, <coughs> of just using head-fixed animals, which are suspended uh, on top of a 24 centimeter uh, polystyrene uh, treadmill, which has effectively friction-reduced um, bearings, so when the animal actually uh, engages in trying to walk or engages in trying to move, then there's very little friction. And it can generally, it can walk, it can run, um, and it can, do group, it can sit and do grooming behavior, so it's, it's covering, let's say, uh, at least some of the behavioral repertoire can all be, albeit the fact that it's um, head fixed. 
So we're recording, the recordings I'm going to be showing you are from layer 2, 3, which in the, the mouse motor cortex is about 180 to 400 microns under the surface. Um, and then down in layer 5B, which we'll have to go down to about 650, 700, 800 microns under to be recording from layer 5B, which contains the corticospinal um, projecting neurons. So there's been some work on using intercortical microstimulation to map the sort of different representations of the different um, parts of forelimb uh, motor cortex where uh, if you give into light intercortical microstimulation under our light anesthesia, you can map areas which uh, predominantly produce twitches in the digits, uh, in the elbow, in the wrist, and you can sort of uh, you can map the rep representation of forelimb in the primary motor cortex. So we did pretty much the same thing, uh, just to make sure that in our mice we can um, map what would be areas that predominantly give you um, forelimb movement just to be able to, what we used this for was to then guide, at least find the, the center spot of um, where forelimb motor cortex is so that we can guide our electrophysiological recordings to be in that or as close to that high probability point. So all we're doing is intercortical microstimulation and then mapping out data to produce a probability plot of the coordinates that give the most reproducible um, twitches or movements in forelimb. So this can sort of classify that as forelimb motor cortex. Um, and then all we're doing, as I said, for this first <coughs> set of experiments, we're looking at voluntary spontaneous locomotion. Um, so <coughs> all we're looking at is the contralateral or movement of the contralateral forelimb, and the movement we're looking at is not a specific. We're not actually identifying or, or uh, characterizing the kinematics of the actual movement. All we're looking at is the steady state difference between relative inactivity and the transition to steady state movement, whether that be walking, running, um, or grooming. And we find that actually the cell, the, the effect that you see in the cells that I'm going to talk about um, don't seem to be specific to a particular movement. So if it walks, it runs, or it grooms, we still see the same effects in those cells. So that's the experimental setup that we're using, uh, Pat's clamp, and then using high-speed digital imaging to then be able to sync and be able to, to separate out our periods of inactivity versus periods of movement. So the first thing we did was just to go down and have a look at what the memory potential dynamics of, of the different uh, neurons are in superficial and deep layers. Um, and here's a representative example of a recording made from uh, layer 2-3. And in general, um, layer 2-3 cells are sitting probably about minus 60, 65 uh, millivolts. Um, and what you see is, which is similar across auditory cortex, uh, visual cortex, somatic sensory cortex, is that under quiet wakefulness, when the animal isn't moving, you see these large, um, large amplitude slow oscillations, um, which makes the memory potential distribution relatively uh, wide. And here's an example of where the threshold is. And in general, the memory potential distribution is quite far away from the threshold, so you don't get that many spontaneous threshold crossings. And on average, layer two, three cells are firing on the order of about 0.1 to 0.5 hertz. So what is the time scale here? Here, is the motion. Oh, yeah. Two seconds or four? Um, okay. Yeah. Um, so <coughs> this would be probably on the order. So it's spiking about 1.5 hertz. So that would be about. I don't know, four or five seconds there, three, four or five seconds. So when the animal then begins to move in layer two, three, what we generally tend to see is a, a moderate depolarization of the cell, which shifts the membrane potential towards thresholds. But there's a, a suppression of these large amplitude slow oscillations. And this is similar to what's seen by um, uh, James Boulay and Carl Peterson, the somatic sensory cortex. Um, and this tightening of the memory potential distribution, even though there's a rightward shift because of the moderate depolarization, this tightening of the memory potential distribution maintains this distance away from threshold. And pretty much we have recorded, I think, from 20 or 30 different cells, and we've yet to see um, cells that are actually responding uh, to the movement. So there's no increase in firing rate in layer 2-3 uh, or in the paradigm, behavioral paradigm we're using, we don't see any change in but to a certain extent, that's rather odd because the introductory slide I gave you 
or we talked about from Daniel Dombek's work in David Tank's lab, um, where they're suspended above a ball. If I play this again, and they're quite weak from this, yeah, there's a very low firing rate if the calcium rises are going to be at a reflection of the firing rate. But then once the animal begins to move, then you almost see an explosion of activity in layer 2B. So it seems to be a mismatch between what we're finding and what they're finding. So we haven't proved that any further as yet. The only real um, sort of thing that we can think that might be the reason is, so our animals are on a linear, uh, effectively a linear single axis treadmill. So once they've been habituated for a while, they generally just walk in one direction and that's, they just keep going round. Whereas actually if I play this again, there's one thing that anybody who's been working with uh, or seen the ball in action, when you, walk, when, it, when you watch and it actually starts to move, you can see that it's, it's going from side to side, it's, going, it's not actually just going in one particular directed movement, in one particular axis. And it's sort of, if the ball swings as well, it has a bit of momentum so that the, the animal can be moved out of place. Even though it didn't intend to be there, it'll actually be swung out. So we have an indicate, well, we have thoughts that this level of activity may be actually to do with a mismatch of where the intended motor command may have been intending the animal to go, but then there's huge sensory feedback to say that actually the mouse is not in the same position as it thought it might have been, and then it has to readjust itself to go back to where it was. That's only a, a, a sort of speculation at the moment, but that could be the reason why, because layer 2-3 from, um, from Gordon Shepard's work and Carlson Bowden's work seems to get a, a large sensory input from S1. So maybe there's actually uh, either thalamic drive or, or um, cortical cortical interactions that are actually bringing this sensory mismatch information, let's say, um, into layer 2 feet, but purely speculation. So that's layer two, three, um, and then if we descend down into layer five, um, typically layer five B cells, so these are the, the cells that potentially have corticospinal projecting neurons, which can directly influence um, behavior or movement. Typically, layer five B cells sit about 10 millivolts more depolarized than layer two B cells. So on average, they're much closer to uh, thresholds. There's a distribution in the quiet wakefulness and threshold there and you get quite a number of spontaneous special crossings, so the baseline firing rate of layer 5 B cells is around sort of between 3 and 5 hertz. Again, in layer 5 B, you see these large, um, slow, uh, well, slow, large amplitude membrane potential oscillations. When the animal begins to move, um, what we saw emerging was two different populations of layer 5 B cells. This particular cell that I'm showing here is what we class as a layer 5B suppressed cell. And what we find in these cells is that there's no real uh, change in the average membrane potential, but you get a suppression of these uh, slow, large amplitude membrane potential oscillations. Um, and by suppressing these large, slow oscillations, or fluctuations, should I say, it actually tightens the membrane potential distribution. So uh, by tightening the membrane potential distribution, distribution, it brings it further away from threshold, and you get no change in the average membrane potential, so actually you get less spontaneous special crossings and less spiking. So actually these cells reduce the firing rate during movement. So what do the time scale be this uh, It should be pretty much the same, so it will be on about, whatever that will be, about two, three, four seconds here. Because it's firing at about five hertz. And, and, the, and the shaded area is where the movement. That's the movement, yes. So the so this container firing area is about three hertz. Yes, yeah, about three to five hertz. On a, I mean, it's, it goes everything from one, but on average, it's about three to five hertz. And then that's suppressed the movement. It, yeah, brings it down to maybe one two hertz. So that's layer five B suppressed cells, um, and then and. The, this constituted about 50% of the cells we were looking at, um, and from an electrophysiological point of view, and we're probing the morphology and all the intrinsic excitability of the di different cells, but let's say so far we can't actually find any electrophysiological characteristics that would separate these two cells. So to all intents and purposes, they seem to be the same in terms of, of uh, excitability and activity. So these are layer 5B, which we classified as enhanced cells, um, and these, again, were sitting about uh, minus 55, minus 60 millivolts. They had a baseline firing frequency of about 5 hertz. 
it's not so easy to see on this particular uh, example, but they do also have these large uh, or slow large amplitude membrane potential fluctuations. So on the onset of movement, these slow fluctuations are again suppressed, but there's a steady state um, depolarization which shifts the membrane potential distribution to the right. Um, and this actually enhances the number of spontaneous threshold crossings. So these cells, these layer 5B enhanced cells, actually increase their fire rate. And they can go from anything from 5 hertz up to 30, 40, 50 hertz. So quite a profound change. I mean, the extreme is 40, 50 hertz. On average, it would be up to about 20, 25 hertz. And you look at the, the changes during the movement period, you have, you have periods when there is more movement in the beginning and the middle, then you have periods when there is less movement. So do you also find that it's a linear relationship? So we've been trying to prove that, but we haven't really come out with anything that's, uh, that sort of fits. We try to separate out into different. The difficulty is, and hindsight is a wonderful tool, uh, the reason being why everyone uses, to a certain extent, trained or learned tasks to do, because you can get hundreds, hundreds of repetitions of the same thing. And um, the problem with this is it's spontaneous voluntary locomotion. So you patch onto a cell, you wait for the animal to move it moves on its own accord and in general what we'll probably in the length of a recording maybe only get I don't know two three moving bouts if we're lucky so in terms of statistics it's not so easy to to really get at that and we couldn't really find just looking along a single trace and the motion index it's difficult because it's not a true readout of muscle movement it's a readout of the pixel to pixel changes in the gross movement of the animal so it's not even as good to say okay the forelimb and we're not analyzing the actual kinematics of the forelimb, which would be much nicer to be able to get that, okay, is it this kind of movement, is it, you know, what specific parts of the movement are related to different firing patterns, which is what we want to get into by using lever pressing or, or joystick movement for exactly that. <coughs> so it's a sort of caveat, a limitation of the, the experimental setup we're using. Um, how will separate the In terms of? In terms of this. Yeah, okay, so there's, we only found statistically, so we've done some rigorous statistics to make sure that they definitely are, it's not just an undulation of the baseline, that some go up, some go down. And um, so there's only three cells out of, I think we've now got in the order of 60 or 70 cells, there's only about three or four cells that don't um, react. In terms of the, the percentage change in the firing frequency, you do get a whole spectrum, so you get some cells that only double and right up to the 50 hertz changes on the other side. And it goes both ways as well. So the, the suppressed cells also decrease their firing frequency to different levels, likewise with the enhanced. Okay, so just to, just to sort of recap uh, from the cells we've got, um, layer two, three, to all intents and purposes, if we want to look at the functional characterization of these cells, then we only saw one cell that actually really changed its, its firing frequency during movement. Um, Layer 5B suppressed cells decrease the firing frequency. And we think this is probably because the standard deviation of the membrane potential, because of the suppression of these large, slow oscillate, uh, fluctuations, decreased, brings the membrane potential uh, further away from uh, threshold, and you get less spontaneous crossings. And on average, there's no change in the average membrane potential. Um, whereas layer 5B enhanced cells, they show an increase in, in frequency. One thing to note here in terms of the the standard deviation of the memory potential is that actually in layer 5B enhanced cells it doesn't appear to change. The slow oscillations, we'll go into that in a bit more detail in a second, but the slow oscillations are suppressed, but something seems to replace that slow oscillations to maintain the memory potential variability. And I think that's key to why these cells actually uh, enhance the firing rate. So we'll go into that in a little bit more detail. Okay, so then when Paolo, who did all this work, uh, then went to have a look in a little bit more detail uh, at the subthreshold memory potential. <coughs> Uh, during quiet wakefulness uh, and movement periods. So what he did is he took the traces and then switched them into the, the, the frequency domain and then had a look at uh, the sort of um, the power in different frequency bands and it's not dissimilar to what has been seen in uh, some of sensory cortex or visual cortex that under quiet wakefulness we see quite a, a, a peak between uh, 1 and 5 hertz which is the delta frequency range or delta frequency band. Now delta frequency has been more associated with sleep or anesthesia previously, but more and more papers are coming out to say that even under quiet wakefulness or relative in a, you know, uh, inattentive or not engaged in a task, you see these uh, slow oscillations occurring between one and five hertz. Um, you can see here on the left that in terms of the power 
uh, within that different frequency range, it sort of comes in and out uh, in, in terms of, of power. And probably that's just to do with the fact that the animal's just sitting there, so even though it's not, uh, it's, it's during quiet wakefulness and not engaged in the task, it's probably the level of, of attention is going in and out as it just sits there. But when the animal begins to move, then these slow membrane tensile fluctuations are, are re significantly reduced. You can see that a decrease in the power across that range. Um, and then we just looked at higher frequency, just in case there was a change in the, the higher frequency component of the membrane tensile, but between quiet wakefulness uh, and, and movement, there wasn't really very much of a change. So this in layer 2-3, uh, which doesn't really change its, its firing frequency during movement. And then we do the same for layer 5-B suppressed, so these are the, the cells that decrease the firing frequency, you see pretty much the same again, albeit the, the, uh, the, the power in the, in the, across the delta frequency band is a little bit lower, but it's still definitely there. Um, and when the, the animal begins to move, the power across the, the delta band frequency is significantly reduced. Again, if we look at higher frequency input, it doesn't really seem to change. But if we go to layer 5B enhanced neurons, again, the profile is pretty similar. You see a nice peak in the 1 to 5 hertz, suppressed and uh, during movement. <coughs> but when we had a look at the higher frequency um, components of, of the memory potential, it seemed to indicate that during movement, which is the red, there seems to be an increase in the higher frequency input to these cells, which potentially could be the reason why um, it's getting this sort of steady state depolarization. And when I mentioned the fact that the slow membrane potential fluctuations are suppressed, but the actual standard deviation of the membrane potential is maintained. So something is replacing the lack of these slow oscillations, and it could potentially be the fact that you get an increase in higher frequency input, potentially from an increase in synaptic input. No, so they're clipped. Yeah, they're clipped at thresholds, second derivative of the... So, what we can see just looking at the general population in terms of the delta frequency, um, as has been seen, which seems to be a cortical-wide um, uh, uh, sort of motif or, or thing that you can actually see across many different cortical areas is when during quiet wakefulness you have a relatively high delta power, but when the animal becomes engaged in a task or becomes engaged in this particular case of movement, you get a distinct suppression of the slow oscillations. And only in layer 5B enhanced cells do you actually see uh, a significant sort of increase in higher frequency input to these cells. So, ideally from a um, from a, a sort of electrophysiological point of view, the ideal experiment that would be done next, and you know, what I've been doing in cultures and slices for a number of years before, is we'd love to go back and then have a look. Okay, what is the actual um, what is the actual change in input? If we could look at you know, voltage clamp these cells and actually have a look and see whether these different cell types are actually getting a change in input structure. But unfortunately, because <laughs> it's layer five, and for space clamp issues, there's no way we can actually do. Um, voltage band recording. So at this point, um, Paolo, who did all this work, he's actually a particle physicist, he went back um, to the informatics department um, and his second supervisor, Mark Van Rossum, um, in informatics. So he started a collaboration with him to see if they could produce a really simple uh, model that they could recapitulate um, some of the, uh, or the memory potential changes that we can, uh, spiking that we can see in our in vivo recording. So all this work is about, I'm not a mathematician, I'm not um, a modeler by any stretch of the imagination, so this is where I um, rely on Mark Van Rossum and his input to, to really try and, and we use this to try and give us some, see if we could get some indication of what might be happening in our cells that we could then go back in vivo to actually test to see if that was um, actually the case. So what they did was, um, and if you're interested in the details, we can uh, talk about that afterwards, we can show you what they did. Um, but they basically just put a very simple, um, uh, simple integrated fire uh, model um, where they have long normal distributed pass on excitatory inhibitory inputs. Obviously, this um, type of modeling completely disregards any don dendritic nonlinearity, dendritic morphology, or the spatial location of any of the inputs. <coughs> so what the, the simple thing that they were just trying to say was by using this simple model, can we estimate um, to a certain extent? what the SOMA is actually seeing 
that are creating these changes that we're seeing in terms of spike patterns and the subthreshold of memory potential. So, to cut up a sort of long story short, they were managing, uh, and so in their model, what they did was they pretty much tried to constrain everything could from parameters we can record in vivo, but left the free parameters, as far as I'm aware, being the amplitude and the frequency of the inputs um, of excitation and inhibition and the correlation between the, the different inputs. But effectively, at the time, they managed to um, they managed to generate a model that could recapitulate quite faithfully uh, the power density plots, the firing rate, um, the average VM, and the changes that we could actually see. So it gave us it gave us a sort of a way of being able to manipulate the system to see if we could uh, recapitulate some of the changes that we were we were recording. So again, just to cut a long story short, I'm not going to go into any detail, but what they managed to do was um, use this model to sort of mimic layer 5b suppressed cells which decrease the firing rate during movement. And what effectively they found, if anything, that in terms of we're, we're plotting here the change in inhibition conductance versus the change in excitation conductance, on average they sort of estimated that if anything layer 5b enhanced cells may get a slight increase in inhibitory input to these cells, but not really any uh, directed or targeted increase in excitation. Whereas in layer 5b uh, enhanced cells, they were estimating the fact that you got about a 30% increase in excitatory drive to these cells. So this gave us a sort of, uh, at least a, a starting point to say, okay, the prediction is that layer 5b enhanced cells actually get at least a change in their input structure such that they would be getting an increase in excitation, which would result in the steady state depolarization that we saw and the fact that we saw this increase in higher frequency input um, upon movement. So obviously this is a model that's got severe limitations in terms of what you can actually take out of it. So but this made a nice prediction in terms of, okay, can we go back to the data and test whether in actual fact layer 5b enhanced cells do actually get an increase in, in target excitation. What, what was the power spectrum of the input in the model? Power spectrum of the input of the model. Well, this is yeah. the input. Okay. No, this is the memory potential. That's the output. That's the final. Mm -hmm. You have input in the model that has to be input. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the, the power spectrum, the shape of the power spectrum was taken. is going beyond necessarily what I'll be able to answer you in terms of questions. We can talk about this afterwards if you want in terms of all the materials. And you, said, you said that one of the parameters was the power of no, the amplitude and the frequency of the excitation the frequency and the change and the... The frequency is the rate or the frequency? What do you mean by frequency? The frequency would have been the rate and then also the free parameters of correlations of when they're actually arriving. Correlation between, between the excitation and the bit rate. And correlation, I guess, between the excitatory input coming in, whether they're aligned or not aligned. So it's not just a, a steady state frequency, it's going to come in um, with large amplitude, I guess, when there's correlated inputs coming in. terms of how they're modeled. So in terms of the model, they're just trying to um, recapitulate. So the layer 5b suppressed it has, or they're trying to model the fact that there's a decrease in uh, memory potential variance, no change in average VM. Whereas the layer 5b enhanced, they're trying, uh, they're, uh, trying to faithfully rep uh, reproduce the fact that the average memory potential variance is the same, and there's also a steady state, but there's a steady state depolarization of those cells. Why don't we talk about that afterwards? Because this is their, this is their work, so I mean, it's, uh, uh, we've got all the materials and methods here, so we can discuss that afterwards exactly how they're, they're doing this if you like. So this gives us a, a sort of uh, uh, an indication of what might actually be happening because of the limitations of the model. We want to go back in vivo. Um, and be able to see whether, in actual fact, what the, the prediction for the model was, or what the model was predicting, we could actually see. So what Pilot did was he went back and 
uh, generated an event detection algorithm that effectively was looking for um, fast rising uh, compound events. Um, they were estimating on the fact that the layer 5b cells, even on the quiet wavelengths, are probably getting on the order of 2 to 3 kilohertz worth of excitatory input. So the chance of a, an event detection algorithm picking up single uh, EPSPs is almost zero. So what we did was try to find um, an event detection algorithm that was sensitive enough, sensitive enough to, find, to pick out um, fast rising uh, events that occurred within the membrane. Uh, time constant, so the memory time constant of these cells is about, on average, about 68 um, milliseconds. So they're using a time window, of, or he's using a time window of 5 milliseconds. So fast rising events occur. And he managed to get it down to the sensitivity by, um, by uh, looking at using it in the model, how sensitive it could be, could get down to being able to selectively pick out uh, EPSPs that are on the order of about 1 millivolt. Then what he did was, yeah, so up here, uh, the magenta shows where it's actually picking up, but for uh, uh, illustration purposes, this is just picking up ones that are over 4 millivolts in, in amplitude. So when we pass the event detection algorithm through in control and during movement uh, in layer 5b suppressed cells, which in general don't appear to be getting uh, any targeted increase in excitation, when we pass the event detection algorithm through during quite wakefulness movement, there doesn't seem to be any uh, any change. But in layer 5b enhanced cells, which have this steady state depolarization, and was predicted that you might see a, a sort of focused targeted increase in excitation, again across the, the input amplitude range, we do actually see during movement that you see an increase in the rate of the frequency of these excitatory events, which kind of fits with the fact that this sort of excitation would be driving the, the memory depolarization, and the increase in the frequency may be maintaining this. This um, increase in the period. Isn't this just a consequence of the fact that you have the more uh, increased higher frequencies? So you have higher frequencies, and then this event detecting algorithm will just latch onto this uh, situation and will find uh, an increase in these rates. But I mean, I would expect that just because you have higher increased amplitude in higher frequencies, that's what you get. So yeah, I mean, we've tested up to the sort of rate that we'll be expecting it to do in model situation to see whether it actually follows it faithfully knowing what you put in um, and it's, it's pretty faithful so it's, it's managing to pick it off. There will be some component of that but we don't think that it's a limitation of the algorithm that you do. So it seems that these layer 5 being hand cells seem to be getting this sort of dedicated targeted um, increase in, in excitation and so in terms of the change in the input structure as to what this actually means for the transformation of, of input in these cells to meaningful behaviorally relevant spike output patterns. What Pilot did was then go back to using his model again um, and sort of set up a, a, a sort of theoretical experiment where he wants to look at the input output function. So he injects uh, EPSC like waveforms into his model um, of varying sizes and does many, many repetitions. So we can look at the injection of an EPSC and what the EPSP uh, the resulting EPSP amplitude will be. <coughs> so we can start to form an input output curve in terms of the EPSP amplitude and the probability that that EPSP will actually evoke a spike. Um, and then what he did was he set up the model. So he set up the model to act like a layer 5B suppressed cell. So that's where it decreases the, the memory potential variability and there's no change in average memory potential. Um, and then what I can show here is that, as has been shown you know, many times in other papers, when you don't change the average memory potential, but you change the variance, in this case decreasing the variance, you get a change in the slope of the input output function. And that's been shown many times before. And then in terms of layer 5B enhanced cells, which in general don't change their memory potential variability, but there's a steady state um, change in, in average memory potential, then what you see is a, an offset change or in terms of this way. So you just see a shift in the input output curve towards the left. And this has been seen many times before in, in, in a variety of different cell types across different areas of the brain. But what was interesting to us was from our, our work where we're looking using the event detection algorithm to look at the range of amplitudes that we see in layer 5B enhanced cells, uh, layer 5B cells, the input amplitude range is pretty much in this <coughs> box. So we don't really see events that are much more than about 9, 10 millivolts in size. So then it got interesting times when we wanted to look at gain and offset um, in these 
and these neurons. But in actual fact, when we focus in on here, in the sort of the, the amplitude range that we see in vivo, and when we actually compare these, we find that actually changing the variance or changing the average membrane potential have the same effect if you look across the, the input amplitude range that we get. So if you look across here, and all we're doing is, is uh, in control is here, and then we're uh, decreasing the variance, we see a change in the gain, but if you look across, and if you um, decrease the mean, again you see the offset, but if you look across this range, and do, just do the simple subtraction, across the input amplitude range we're seeing, it actually has the same effect. So it's, it's m it, and the same as if we do the opposite direction where we increase the variance uh, or we increase the mean, again, if you look across here and do on you know, in general across the input amplitude range, we have the same effect. So maybe it's less about gain and offset in this particular situation, but maybe just about the sensitivity or the change in sensitivity of that neuron to incoming synaptic input. So that was from the model. So then Pablo went back and he, he sort of did the same experiment but doing it in vivo where he did the same thing where he was injecting EPS seeds into the soma and then looking um, at the probability of evoking a spike with a, uh, an EPSP of that particular uh, amplitude. And he could then generate input-output um, functions. So this is in a layer 5B suppressor, which decreases its firing during movement. The recording here, and then he's inputting his EPS seeds. And then in control, we get our input-output curve across here. But in layer 5B suppressed cells, we actually see that they decrease their sensitivity to incoming synaptic input. So these are the cells that decrease the firing rate, but it seems to be that to a certain extent, these cells are potentially abstracting themselves uh, from the network to say, well, actually, we're going to be really less sensitive. So if there was other, you know, if it's integrating other synaptic input that's coming in, they'd be much less sensitive um, than in quite a reformer situation. Um, and if you just look at the sensitivity ratio, which is just a simple subtraction from the two, then an average uh, sensitivity is sort of half. But then if we go the opposite, then we use the layer 5B enhanced cells. So these are the ones that are increasing their um, firing frequency during movement. Again, you can see the control curve, but the reverse happens. So these cells, because of probably the shift towards uh, threshold, is these cells become much more sensitive to incoming synaptic input. So they'll be really receptive to any kind of the integration of, of, of other inputs that are coming in during movement. And in terms of the sensitivity ratio, it's almost, it's almost doubled. So just to head towards a conclusion, a couple of other slides to go after this, but in terms of our sort of working, um, working uh, schema of what's going on, under quiet wakefulness, it appears that all, and in this case it's just layer 5, so in layer 5b, all layer 5b uh, parameter neurons show these slow, large amplitude membrane potential fluctuations. I haven't shown you the data today, but we find that the, the 5 hertz basal firing frequency seems to be locked to the peak of each of the oscillations, which is, again, not, not necessarily surprising. Um, the membrane potential is sitting about minus 55 millivolts, not too far away from thresholds, so you get a number of spontaneous <coughs> threshold crossings, and on average, it's about 5 uh, hertz firing frequency. When the animal begins to move, then I think all layer 5B suppressed cells, you get the suppression of the slow large amplitude oscillations, which tightens the membrane potential distribution, brings it away from thresholds, and in layer 5B suppressed cells, which don't get this targeted increase in excitation, there's no rightward shift, and there's actually a decrease in the firing frequency. As a result of this change in input structure, we also see a decrease in the sensitivity of these neural state incoming synaptic input. Layer 5B enhanced cells, see the suppression of the slow oscillation or slow fluctuations, but they get this targeted increase in excitation, which pulls the membrane potential across towards threshold. There's more spontaneous threshold crossings, so you actually get an increase in the fire frequency, and there's an increase in the overall sensitivity of these uh, neurons. So that's where we're sort of at, at the moment, but in terms of so that's a sort of functional characterization of these two different subpopulations in layer 5b, um, but the question that has been asked um, as we're trying to publish this is the fact that, okay, you see these different changes, but this is motor cortex, and I said that I purposely went to layer 5b, or we purposely went to layer 5b, because they have corpus final projecting neurons, so they can potentially directly influence motor behavior. So the big question that's remaining open, and I'm going to give you the answer just now, but is where, where, where are these cells projecting to? Because that will really start to give us a handle on 
what type of information is actually being propagated either back into the motor system or down to actually initiate movement. So we tried a few different techniques and obviously the referees have asked for the simplest experiment that we could ever hope for. Um, but to be able to identify, so the projection targets of, of cortical cells can be sort of easily split into two. You have one that's PT type neurons or pyramidal type neurons which actually send an action collateral down into the brainstem and some ultimately down into the spinal cord. And then you have intratelencephalic neurons, which are basically all the other neurons that don't send a projection down to the brainstem and down to the spinal cord. So what we wanted to do is know whether our layer 5b cells that we've been recording from are either IT, projecting back into the motor system, let's say, or PT, that's actually projecting down into the spinal cord to uh, modulate or initiate movement. So it's taken a good three or four months to actually set this up, but what we do is we inject retrograde tracer beads into the pons, which traces all um, the BT type neurons back into M1. We do contralateral dorsal striatum and corpus callosum to try and uh, select out all the IT neurons, which send projections across to the contralateral side of the uh, M1. And then we go in with our patch electrodes make a recording from a single cell, fill that cell with biocytin and then stain with a third fluorophore and then do all the post to try and go and find that single cell that we've been recording from. It's taken four months for a reason, um, but that's the, that's the sort of experimental paradigm and in terms of, so this is a this is sort of layer 5b starting here and it goes down an awful lot further. We've got to the point that we can get pretty much good coverage over, over layer 5b you can get good IT neurons and you can get good PT neurons and it's great. Um, problem is that each of those injections are probably about 60 to 70 percent successful in terms of hitting all the neurons. So the heroic work of now two po a PhD student and a postdoc in the lab have been going for three months now um, and we have N of two. Um, last month well, was at SFN last week and I got an email saying, we just recorded from six different neurons, the injections were good, it's going to be good. I'll give you an email on Saturday. No email on Saturday, no email on Sunday, no email on Monday. Got back on whenever it was, Tuesday, and there was sort of, yeah, glum looking faces because all six of those neurons were completely surrounded by red cells, green cells, and that cell had absolutely no beads in it whatsoever. Those six cells didn't have any beads whatsoever. You cannot get a bead unlucky. But yeah, so here's two cells, you can't really see it too much here, but this has basically got uh, red retrobead, so it's a PT type neuron. So that's the one that would be descending to the spinal cord. Just so happens this is a layer 5B enhanced cell, which increases its firing rate. Another <coughs> cell, which is green across here, so this is the PT ones, and it happens to be a layer 5B suppressed cell, so place your bet. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to say either way, because it'll, it'll come back to haunt me, I guess. But well, that's the experiments we're doing now. We're, we're also trying a different technique as well because ultimately it's really, really tough to get a decent data set to be able to see one way or the other. So hopefully in the next month or so we'll be able to complete those experiments and really get... It's kind of a win-win experiment anyway because if it happens that the red beads are, or the layer 5 bead enhanced are all PTs, then we know that, okay, increasing fire frequency goes down the spinal cord and that's initiating movement. But ultimately as well, if half of the beads go back into the motor system, it's like an efferent copy going back in to tell it what's gone down the spinal cord. So to a certain extent, we're really trying to go after this because it's a win-win sort of experiment. Okay, so that wraps it up. Um, huge amount of credit to a PhD student who came from the informatics department, um, tapped in the door and said he's a particle physicist who was working on the Hadron Collider, um, but he thought his analytical techniques could be used in, uh, in neurobiology. Uh, and in about four weeks, I've picked up a weight patching. So, uh, Yuli Shiman, who uh, took all the anatomical and tracing techniques into the lab as well, and she's been a real powerhouse in managing to get these last set of experiments to work. Mia Palco, who did some of the modeling. Mark Van Rossum, who, who did all the modeling with me and uh, Paolo. Uh, Maris Kupfers Coles, uh, and Josh Dacre. Uh, the EPSRC, the Royal Society, and especially the Wellcome Trust, who has for a number of years. Uh, funded and continues to fund all the work that we do in the lab.
slicing in one direction, then most likely you're going to change the memory availability of the bias of one versus seven. So yes, if we're going to pick out the expectation. And in terms of the expectation, we don't we don't know where or how that's coming. Because it, one way it could be if the target increase, let's say, a drive in Talos, it's actually saying, okay, here comes the expectation coming into these cells. Equally, the animal is switching from being uh, inactive to being active, so there's a change in arousal state. So neuromodulation could play a large role in actually generating that steady state depolarization we see, because it could have changed the uh, release probability of any of the incoming uh, expectation. Every single time I give this talk, it's exactly the question because it's brilliant. We have spent four years blind patching in cortex. We have one interneuron recording. <laughs> <laughs> well, we have one interneuron and two uh, ground cells that are stable. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure if you make that many good conclusions from a single <laughs> with 40 pyramidal cells and one interneuron. I wouldn't really like. Yeah, it, I don't know. I have no idea from it. If anybody can help, it's blind patching, so it's fine. You're bumping into the biggest cells out there. That's okay. But you'd say one or two in every 20, you're going to bump into an interview and get a good recording. And that was my naive thought at the start, which is brilliant. We'll get two sets, and I'll be able to not use the modeling. We'll be able to say, there's expectation, there's inhibition. We know how it's changing. I have no idea. In the cerebellum, we've got a whole project that's based entirely on interview recordings. Same interview, same size, slightly different part of the brain. And we've got 30, 40 recordings from interview. So I have no idea why in context, but that's why we need targeted patching. But in layer 5, that's hard because that's 600 that comes under the surface, so it's a technical limitation to doing that well. Uh, we would love, my, my, all my background is into new, so I thought we were going to be bumping into many of the but I don't know why.